Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Last week, for those of you who were here, how many were here for last week, by the way? Oh, lots, lots of returning people. I didn't scare you off yet, huh? All right, that's good. That's good. Last week, we talked about a little bit about the history of Alcoholics Anonymous, how our fellowship came to be, how our book, more importantly, came to be, which we know from last week is the basic text of our society, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more this morning. If everybody can open to the, uh, the title page, the table of contents of the book, that's where we're going to start. And I just want to say a few words sort of recapping last week. And a couple of things, I want to clear up a couple of things I said last week. I screw one thing up at least every week, okay? That's just the rule. We'll get it out of the way now, okay? Uh, last week, uh, we talked about some recovery rates that are found in the forward to the second edition of our book. And somebody gave, came up to me after the meeting and they said, gosh, boy, I'm really depressed. Our recovery rate today isn't what it was in 1939, and boy, that's really depressing, and I was in such a hurry because I knew we were running over, I forgot to give you the hope. See, typical alcoholic, I forget to give you the hope, right? The hope is, okay, and this is the whole point of last week, was I still have access to a 75% or greater rate of recovery for myself and the people that I work with if I follow the precise directions that are outlined in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Does that make sense to everybody? That was the whole point of last week. And my assertion last week was that the reason that they had a better rate of recovery than we do today, and there are many reasons. I mean, AA is much bigger. It's a different, there's different people coming to AA now than there were then. Somebody asked me that after the meeting. I agree with that. I agree with that. But I would also say that a major reason that AA was more successful then, and it's not my opinion, okay? You could read the history. Many of the founders of our program felt that AA was more successful then than it is now because the program of recovery has gotten garbled in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, that the program of recovery has gotten watered down over the course of time, okay? And so that's why we're interested in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. And I handed out a little uh, little handout called the Big Book Goals. And I want to just say that in order to understand our book, we have to first understand the purposes or the goals of the book. Can I have one, by the way? I didn't save one for myself. Can I borrow yours just for a second? Thank you, thank you, thank you. And it looks something like this, okay? And I want to say that these visual aids are not meant to add or take away from anything that's in the book. They're just a visual representation, okay? And you can do whatever you want with them. You can make paper airplanes, throw it at somebody. I don't care, okay? This just I'm a visual thinker, and this kind of helps me to understand what's in the book, okay? And you'll notice on this sheet called the Big Book Goals that the first goal of the big book is to identify in the far left-hand box on the top what is the problem, okay? And that's what we're going to be talking about primarily today and a little bit next week in Bill's story and the doctor's opinion. That is where they lay out what is my problem. And if you look in that bottom box, step one is a statement of the problem. I am powerless and my life is unmanageable. That's the problem. Anybody disagree with that? Okay, that's the problem, right? That's why we're all here, right? Okay. My problem is I'm powerless and my life is unmanageable. So very naturally, if my problem is powerlessness, my solution is power, right? And that's what the second step talks about, a power greater than myself restoring me to sanity, okay? So the solution to lack of power is power, okay? And the second goal of the book, if you look there in the middle of the page, is the solution. If I know what my problem is in the doctor's opinion, where they're going to give me a medical description of my problem, and in Bill's story where they're going to give me a textbook case of the problem the doctor describes in the doctor's opinion, then the next thing I need to know is what is my solution. Okay? And we're going to be discussing that in Chapter 2, Chapter 3, or at least the last two pages of Chapter 3, and all of we agnostics. Okay? So, in other words, the first 60 pages of our book are designed to convince me of two ideas and two ideas only. What is my problem, step one, and what is my solution, step two. And Bill is going to do what I call the one-two punch all the way through the first 60 pages in the doctor's opinion. In other words, he's going to, and we're going to start it today when we go through the doctor's opinion, he's going to start by giving us an example of the problem, 
Step one, bang, powerlessness. He's going to give us an example of it, okay? Then a couple sentences later, he's going to hit us with the solution, the idea of power, okay, solving our problem. And then a couple of pages later, he's going to go back again and word it differently. Again, another example of the problem, powerlessness, bang. And then he's going to hit us again a couple sentences later with the solution, step two. And he's going to do this all the way through to page 60. Problem, solution, powerlessness, power, problem, solution, step one, step two. And when we get to page 60, he's going to ask us to make a decision. He's going to begin to ask us to make a decision based on our own experience and what we've learned in the first 60 pages. And he's hoping that he can word it in just such a way that by the time we reach page 60, we will have come to accept the idea of step one and come to accept the idea of step two, that we will be able to make a decision in step three. Okay, And the decision that we make in step three, incidentally, okay, is really a decision, do I want to live in the problem? Step one. If I do, then I can go drink. Or do I want to live in the solution? Step two. Okay. If I want to live in the solution, then the third goal of the book is the action necessary for recovery on the far right-hand side. And that's where chapters 5, 6, and 7 come in. That is the program of recovery, the program of action, that is going to help me find the power that they talk about in step 2, which is going to solve my problem that we talked about in step 1. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So that is how our book is laid out. And for someone who's out there wondering, chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11 are all about, now that I've had this spiritual experience, now that I've learn this new way of life. It's all about applying that solution, applying that way of that new way of living, that manner of living in every area of my life, in my job, with my family, with my wife, with my husband, with my kids, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So that's that. We can set that aside. Here you go, young lady. Thank you very much. All right. So our book, we found out last week is a textbook, and our book is laid out much like many textbooks are laid out, in a, uh, a principle of, of cognitive learning called sequential learning. And there's a reason I'm telling you this, okay? Because I thought when I read this it was kind of like a novel. You could take little bits and pieces and take what you wanted, and you'd, you'd be so inspired, and then you'd put it down, and you'd never read it again, right? And when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I, I wanted to know what to do the last time, uh, they said, well, open to Chapter 5 and do what it says, Right? And, uh, and, and so that's what I did, and there was a lot of stuff that I really didn't understand very well. And what I found out later on was that there's a reason that there's four chapters that come before chapter five. For example, let's say I go to math class on the first day, and I don't know anything about math, and they say open to chapter five and try to work the problems there. Am I going to be able to do it? Probably not, right? But if I open to chapter one, and they teach me the basic principles of math, they teach me how to add and subtract. And then in chapter 2, they teach me how to multiply and divide. And in chapter 3, they teach me decimals. And in chapter 4, they teach me fractions. Then when I get to chapter 5, I will have learned enough based on learning from the previous chapters to be able to do what is mentioned in chapter 5. Does that make sense? Well, our book is laid out the same way. And the entire reason that they put the doctor's opinion first, if you'll open there, because that's where we're going to start, is because the rest of the book is about overcoming the illness that he describes in the doctor's opinion. And we're going to spend the rest of today talking about step one. Incidentally, Bill spends more time talking about step one in the workings text than any other step. Okay? It's also the only step he says we can work perfectly. Okay? The other steps he says are ideals. They're measuring sticks by which we estimate our progress. So the only step I have to do perfectly for those of you who are new is step one. Okay, it's the only, and, and incidentally, step one for me was the hardest step to take. And for many of us it is. You know, for many of us, step one is the hardest step there is. Okay, because there's just something within me that just cries out against the idea of personal powerlessness. Right? There is something within me that will rebel against the idea, and I will cling to the notion that somehow, some way, I am going to find a way to successfully drink, right? I'm going to find a way to successfully manage my own life and be the master of my own destiny, right? And I'll tell you, towards the end of my drinking, 
there were many, many, many times where it was obvious to everyone around me that that was not the case, right? Except for me. Except for the one person that needed to know it, right? And time after time, I went through treatment centers, and time after time, I got out of detox, and time after time, I got out of the hospital, and I said, you know what? I, I said what, what Clancy says all the time, you know, my case is different, right? The credo of every alcoholic, my case is different, right? And it really is true, and I really believe that my case is different, right? And I lived that lie for a long, long time. And so it, some of us never get it. Some people, and you'll see them, I mean, I've, for anybody here who's ever been to a detox, how many people have ever been to a detox meeting here, either as an inmate or as a, as a volunteer, right? Yeah, I've been on both sides of that, right? I, I did a meeting for four years down at the Salvation Army, a couple, couple miles up the road here, you know? And, and, you know, these guys, right, they're one step from Skid Row. One step from Skid Row, but they'll tell you they've got it all together, right? And I understand that. I understand that because that's exactly how I was, you know? And I would, and I believed it. That's the worst part, right? I'm killing myself, but I believe it. All right. So, I want to say a couple things about the doctor's opinion real quickly before we get started here. First thing, notice it's called the doctor's opinion, right? Pretty obvious, right? Why is it called the doctor's opinion? Because in 1939, when they wrote the book, they did not know that this was factual or not. Dr. Silkworth, okay, who wrote our book, Dr. William D. Silkworth, MD, was a neuropsychiatrist, right? And he uh, got to work with alcoholics kind of on accident. He, he really didn't set out to work with alcoholics, but he, in the Depression, you know, you did what you had to do, kind of like we're doing today a little bit, right, <laughs> some of us, right? And, uh, and so he, he ended up working with alcoholics at Towns Hospital. He became the physician-in-chief at Towns Hospital. He worked with over 50,000 alcoholics in his career, okay? And so over the course of time, if you work with 50,000 of anything, I don't care what it is, right, tires, hats, you're going to start to develop some theories about what it is you're working with. And so based on his observation, rather than scientific research, he developed this theory, okay? And we're going to talk about his theory here. He believed we had a two-fold illness, okay? And we're going to talk about that as we get into the doctor's opinion, okay? Now, today we know that everything that he put in the doctor's opinion, that his theory was absolutely sound. In 1956, the AMA... And the American Psychiatric Association confirmed what Dr. Silkworth believed that alcoholism is an illness of the mind and the body. Okay? But we did not know that in 1939. Okay? In 1939, this was very controversial stuff that he put in here. Okay? And that's why when he originally wrote this, he left his name out. Okay? Because he was concerned about his, his uh, reputation. The second thing is, if you look at the bottom of the doctor's opinion, you'll notice some little tiny Roman numerals down there. Everybody see that? Okay, circle those Roman numerals if you haven't already, okay? Now, if you get a copy of the first edition, anybody have a copy of the first edition here? I have one at home, but I don't have one here. If you look in the first edition, you'll see that it appeared on page one, okay? In our book, Bill's story appears on page one, okay? Now, why is that important? Because when they reprinted it for the second edition, somebody at New York got the idea, and I'm not arguing saying it's right or wrong, it is what it is, that because the doctor's opinion was not written by an alcoholic, it should be moved to the Roman numeral section, okay, and Bill's story should start on page one. Now, why is that important? Because it changed the use of the doctor's opinion in the fellowship, okay? I've actually had discussion, passionate discussion, I'll call it, with some people that will tell you that the doctor's opinion is not part of the text of the book, okay? Because when I start reading a book, I don't start with the Roman numerals, do you? I start on page one, right? That's the kind of guy I am, right? And because it changed the use of the doctor's opinion in the fellowship, some people just breeze right over it. What they don't understand is that the doctor's opinion is the foundation of the book. Because as I said earlier, the rest of the book is all about overcoming the illness that he's going to describe right here in these next few pages. Okay? All right. So I'm going to ask some questions during this workshop. If you know the answer, just go ahead and shout it right out. So based on what we learned last week, for those of you who were here, where is the program of recovery found? Is it found in the fellowship or is it found in the book? Okay, well, let's see what it says right here, okay? It says, we of Alcoholics Anonymous believe that the reader will be interested in the medical estimate of the plan of recovery described where? In this book, right? Not a plan of recovery, not one plan of recovery. No, it says the plan of recovery described in this book, okay? So if I want to find the plan of recovery, I'm going to find it where? In the book, right? Now, 
I want to say a little footnote to this. Anybody else here besides me a planner? I'm a planner. I'm a kind of a planning kind of guy. And I remember every time I would go to detox, I would start planning. You know what I mean? I would plan what I was – every time I went to a 30-day treatment center, I would start planning stuff right away, you know. And I'd plan on getting out and where I was going to live and I was going to get a job and I was going to be the kind of son I should be and I was going to pay back those people I owed that money and I wasn't going to go to those places I shouldn't go anymore. Anybody here ever done that? Yeah, yeah. And what I didn't realize – and I remember that we used to get these guys that would come in – Back in those days, they called it H&I. Maybe they still do. They would come in to the detox or they'd come into the treatment center and they'd bring meetings in from the outside, right? And I don't know what it was, but I really thought that you AA people were really interested in all my plans that I had, what I was going to do when I got out, you know? And so I would kind of share these plans, you know, and these guys, these people would just kind of look at me, you know, because they knew I was kidding myself, Right? And I'll tell you, I never accomplished not one of those plans. You know why? Because usually there was between me and that plan was a liquor store somewhere along the way as soon as I got out, right? And what I found out later on was as long as I had a plan, as long as I had a plan, I was unable to accept the plan of recovery outlined in this book. See, the last time I got out of detox, the last time I got out of treatment, okay, all my plans were done. I didn't have a plan. I didn't know what to do, right? And what I didn't realize is that for me was the key to take the first step. That for me was the key to be able to really apply the program of Alcoholics Anonymous because I was using my program, not the program of AA. All right. Next paragraph down. It says, to whom it may concern, and this is the doctor writing now, I have specialized in the treatment of alcoholism for many years. In late 1934, I attended a patient who, though had been a competent businessman of good earning capacity, was an alcoholic of the type I had come to regard as hopeless. Everybody circle that word. Important word. Keep your finger there and turn to page 43. Page 43. Second paragraph down. Many doctors and psychiatrists agree. Everybody with me? With our conclusions. One of these men, staff member at a world-renowned hospital, recently made this statement to some of us. What you say about the general hopelessness of an alcoholic's plight is, in my opinion, correct. As to two of you men whose stories I've heard, there's no doubt in my mind that you were 100% hopeless apart from divine help. Kind of interesting. Kind of interesting. Notice that he doesn't say difficult case, right? He doesn't say slim chance of recovery, does he, right? No, he says hopeless. Right? That's a pretty powerful word for a doctor to use, because let me tell you something. Doctors, the one thing they don't want to tell you, even if you are hopeless, <laughs> is that you're hopeless. Really, you know? The one, that's the one thing they don't want to tell you, because they want to give you some thread of hope to hold on to. Right? But here's a doctor who's treated thousands of alcoholics, right? And he's saying that in his estimation, alcoholics of our type of my type, of Bill's type, and that's who he's talking about here, late 1934, are hopeless. Why? Because not only did Bill, imagine if you were a doctor and you had a guy who was who was drinking paint, right? And he came in and, and, and you'd have to, every once in a while, you'd have to pump his stomach and, you know, he was just a mess and he had brain damage. And every time he left, he believed he could drink paint again. But this time he was going to be successful. That, that must be what it's like for a guy like Dr. Silkworth, who was not an alcoholic himself, to see a guy like Bill, this is, he's going to talk about in the next paragraph his, the course of his third treatment. Imagine treating someone for chronic alcoholism who's dying, and yet again and again and again he comes back to the hospital, even though he knows it's killing him, right? And that's why Dr. Silkworth was such an advocate of our program. If you ever read the story of his life, it's fascinating, okay? is because of his experience with hopelessness. And that's why the first 25,000 people he treated, he had a 2 to 4% recovery rate by his own admission, okay? And if you're a doctor and you've given your life to helping other alcoholics, you've given your life to helping people, and you have to deal with their children and their wives and explain to them that, yes, your, your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter has an illness, and I've tried, I've done everything that I can, and they're probably going to die, okay? 
I mean, imagine the feeling that he must have had. And that's why he was such an advocate of Alcoholics Anonymous, because he saw something here that he could not give us. And he's going to talk about that in a couple of more pages. Okay? All right. Now, uh, it goes on to say, in the course of his third treatment, he acquired certain ideas concerning a possible, uh, possible, where am I? I lost my... Means of recovery, thank you. As part of his rehabilitation, he commenced to present his conceptions to other alcoholics, impressing upon them that they must do likewise with still others. This has become the basis of a rapidly growing fellowship of these men and their families. This man and over 100 others appear to have recovered, right? You remember from last week, we talked about three times we found that same word, didn't we? Right? This is the fourth time. We're going to find it one more time when we get to page 17. Right? Where it says nearly all have recovered. They have solved the drink problem. Right? You see, I'm not a recovering alcoholic. I have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body, which means that I no longer have the obsession as a result of the 12 steps. And because I no longer have this obsession, I no longer drink and the physical allergy does not manifest itself. And we're going to talk about that here in the next page. Next page. Right under where it says, very truly yours, William D. Silkworth. And I'm not giving you the Roman numeral number because I have a third edition and I know some of you have a fourth edition and I don't want to confuse you. All right. And as I said, the big writing is the alcoholics and the small writing is the doctor. So pay close attention to who's saying what here. Okay. It says here underneath William D. Silkworth, M.D., the physician who at our request gave us this letter has been kind enough to enlarge upon his views in another statement which follows. In this statement, he confirms what we who have suffered alcoholic torture must believe, that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind. And let's stop right there for a minute. You'll remember last week, Dr. Silkworth had developed a, can you hand me that book right there? had developed a theory on alcoholism, okay? And he's going to talk about the physical manifestation in the next paragraph, but he talks about the body of the alcoholic and the mind of the alcoholic, okay? And I said last week that when he talks about the body of the alcoholic, he's talking about the allergy of the body, okay? This idea that I have an allergic reaction that he's going to start talking about to alcohol, okay? But unlike some allergies, I don't break out in hives, or I don't get, you know, uh, my, my tongue doesn't get uh, bumps on it, okay, I break out in what he's going to call a phenomena of craving, okay? And then coupled with that, he said, talks about the mind, that the mind of the alcoholic is different. And I said last week, and I'll say it again, that when he talks about the mind of the alcoholic, he's talking about the obsession of the mind, okay? This idea that somehow things are going to be different next time, right? It goes on to say it did not satisfy us to be told that we could not control our drinking just because we were maladjusted to life, that we were in full flight from reality, or that we were outright mental defectives. These things were true to some extent. In fact, to a considerable extent with some of us, that's where some are sicker than others come from, by the way, right there. Okay, But we are sure that our bodies were sickened as well. Okay, And this is where the whole trouble starts in, in alcoholism, because please remember that up until this point, alcoholism was, there were two schools of thought on alcoholism. The schools of thought in alcoholism has progressed a lot today, so that when you go to a doctor, when you go to the judge or, or whoever, they, they send you to AA, right? Most of the time, right? They, that's where they send you. But back then, there were really two schools of thought, and to some degree that's still true today. You had the physical health people. And the physical health, the internal medicine people believed that alcoholism was some sort of enzyme imbalance, okay, similar to diabetes, and that if they could just find a way to, to get your enzymes right, give you a pill like insulin, okay, that they could overcome it, okay. And the focus of most of their treatments, and still sometimes today, is if we could just get these people detoxed from alcohol, Right? I mean, because logically, if you think about it, if you're detoxed from something that's killing you, why would you possibly go back to it? Right? Logically, that makes sense to a non-alcoholic. Right? And so, and, and we know that doesn't work, don't we? Right? Because if that worked, detox would turn out winners, wouldn't they? Right? 30-day treatment centers would turn out winners, but they don't. You know, I've been to detox half a dozen times. Okay? And, and you, you get detoxed, 
and then you leave. But, and we know Dr. Bob's experience. Dr. Bob went to six dry out farms, right, and was unsuccessful at staying sober. Then you had the mental health people. And the mental health people believed that if you could just get these wacky alcoholics to understand they cannot drink normally, if you just explain, if they understood the nature of their problem, they really understood it, right, then they wouldn't drink. And logically, that makes sense too, doesn't it? Okay, if you're a non-alcoholic, that if you understand that something's killing you, if you understand you can't do it, why would you possibly go back to it, right? But we talked about last week the experience of Roland Hazard who went and spent a year in intensive psychotherapy with Dr. Carl Jung, right? And he was drunk before he got back on the boat to go back to the United States, wasn't he, right? So Dr. Silkworth realized that there had to be something else, that there had to be some other thing that had to happen for these alcoholics to stay sober. And he's going to start talking about that here in a couple of pages, okay? So... uh I want to read you something here from AA Comes of Age that talks about Silkworth's, and you can, this is from page 13 if you want to reference it later, but he talks about in more detail this, this concept, this opinion, this theory that he developed on alcoholism. And it says, William D. Silkworth, the physician in chief of Charles B. Towns Hospital, a man who was very much a founder of AA, from him we learned the nature of our illness. He supplied us with the tools with which to puncture the toughest alcoholic ego, those shattering phrases by which he described our illness, the obsession of the mind that compels us to drink, and the allergy of the body that condemns us to go mad or die. Right? So he's talking about the allergy, and he's talking about the obsession. All right, next paragraph down in the doctor's opinion. The doctor's theory that we have an allergy. Everybody circle the word allergy. We're coming back to it. To alcohol interests us. As laymen, our opinion as to its soundness may, of course, mean little. But as ex-problem drinkers, we can say that his explanation makes good sense. It explains many things for which we cannot otherwise account. Right? When we get to Bill's story, we're going to come back to that line. It explains many things for which we cannot otherwise account. You know, Bill uh, went to the hospital. He was actually three treatments in Towns Hospital. And he says during one of his visits, when we get to page six or seven, I believe it is, he says that my incredible behavior in the face of a desperate desire to stop was explained, right? Because he understood for the first time, he met Dr. Silkworth, and Silkworth explained to him, Bill, the reason you drink is not because you want to. The reason you drink is because you have an allergy to alcohol, and once you start, you cannot stop no matter how great the necessity or the wish. Allergy. You know, I thought I knew what an allergy was when I came here. If you don't already have this written down from another workshop, an allergy is an abnormal reaction to any food, beverage, or substance. An abnormal reaction to any food, beverage, or substance. I explained that to a guy I sponsored one time, and he asked me if he took Benadryl, could he drink safely? <laughs> now, only an alcoholic would say that, right? I had another guy say to me, well, how can I have an allergy to alcohol? I'm drinking two quarts a day, you know? Yeah, yeah. So what is abnormal? What's an abnormal reaction? Well, if the majority of people have one reaction and the minority of people have another reaction, those in the minority are abnormal, right? That makes sense, right? And people have allergies to many things. People, some people are allergic to strawberries. Some people are allergic to milk. Some people are allergic to various medications. Some people, you give them a shot of penicillin, they just drop dead. You know, that doesn't happen to me, thankfully, you know. I have another allergy besides the allergy that I have to alcohol, I have an allergy to pollen. I have hay fever. Had it all my life, you know. And when I get in the grass certain times of the year, you know, uh, when the oak trees start, you know, throwing off pollen, my eyes start watering and my nose gets stuffed up. And if I, if I get it on my skin, I get these big welts all over me. It's been terribly uncomfortable, right? And so I kind of understand that an allergy has something that causes it and something that happens as a result of it. Okay, that's what basically happens when you have an allergy. But as I said, unlike my allergy to pollen, when I drink alcohol, I don't get welts. When I don't get watery eyes, I develop an internal, I have an internal reaction that I would never guess, right? I would never guess. And the reason that alcoholism is so difficult sometimes for people who are non-alcoholics to understand, because, you know, alcoholics don't care. We drink, we have an abnormal reaction, right? I developed this craving. My buddy, who's a non-alcoholic, he doesn't have that craving, right? And that's not a problem for me. I just want to drink, 
You know what I mean? But the nine who have a normal reaction, and that's what they estimate, about one in ten, less than one in ten, but about one in ten, has an abnormal reaction, right? And immediately the nine who have the normal reaction start trying to figure out the one who has the abnormal reaction, right? And that's always been the case with me. Non-alcoholics are always trying to figure us out, aren't they, right? And they're always offering us tons of advice, aren't they, right, about what we should do, okay? And the reason that it's so difficult for the non-alcoholic to, to understand is it would be no different than if someone were colorblind. If someone's colorblind and I'm looking at that maroon-colored wall the same way they're looking, I assume that they're seeing the same thing that I'm seeing, okay, unless I knew that they were colorblind, okay? A lot of well-meaning people in my life assume that I had the same reaction to alcohol that they did, right? And so that's why non-alcoholics always say things like, just don't drink, right? Oh, God, if I had a dollar for every time I heard that from a non-alcoholic in my life, right? My father used to tell me that. And, and you know, my father, he was a good man. You know, he's still a good man. You know, he, and he tried hard to help me, you know. But what he didn't realize is alcohol didn't do for him what it did for me, see? If it did for him what it did for me, he'd drink like I drink, right? But it doesn't. It has a different effect, and he's going to start talking about that on the bottom page. And often, like I said, this is why people misunderstand alcoholism, and this is oftentimes where there's a difficult time in treating alcoholism, okay? Because unless the people treating it are alcoholics, they don't understand a hell of a lot more about it than the people who have it, right? That's really true, okay? All right, bottom of the page. Though we work out our solution on a spiritual as well as altruistic plane, which means other-centered, other-centered, he's going to say it twice, we favor hospitalization for the alcoholic who is jittery or befogged. More often than, a night is, than not, it is imperative that a man's brain be cleared before he is approached. And this has been true for me. And this is where treatment centers and detoxes are coming very handy, Okay? It says, as he then has a better chance of accepting what we have to offer. Next, uh, next couple paragraphs down, two paragraphs down, where it says, we doctors. Everybody circle that word, we, okay? Now, notice here that he's not just speaking for himself. This is Silkworth again. He is not just speaking for himself here. He's now speaking for the medical fraternity. See, what they do, doctors, is they go, they go to medical conventions, and they talk about people like us, Right? And they say, what do you do with those wacky alcoholics you get in Cleveland, you know? I don't know, you know, take two of these and good luck, you know, that kind of thing, right? It says, we doctors have realized for some time, for a long time, that some form of moral psychology was of urgent importance to alcoholics, but its applications presented difficulties beyond our conception. What with our ultra-modern standards, our scientific approach to everything, Perhaps we are not well equipped to apply the powers of good that lie outside our synthetic knowledge. What's he trying not to say? God, right? He's saying that we realize, we have realized for a long time that there has to be what he calls moral psychology, right? Moral psychology, a new approach to old ideas, right? That there has to be some form of of something other than what we can do. If you go to a doctor, doctors work on empirical evidence, the five senses of the body, right? And if you go to a doctor, they're usually going to do one of two things. They're either going to cut it out of you, or they're going to give you a pill to fix it, right? And if they can't do that, there's really not a hell of a lot they can do for you, right? And he's making a great admission here, isn't he? He's saying, we realize that you alcoholics need something that we can't give you, right? And we realize you need something more than what our ultra moderns in 1939, they're ultra modern standards, right? <laughs> right? And incidentally, when we get over into chapter two, Dr. Jung's going to say the same thing about psychiatry that Silkworth says about medicine. That psychiatrists don't have an answer to our problem either, right? I had a friend back in California, Dr. Mark, and Dr. Mark, uh, he does a lot of speaking. He's been sober a long time. And, uh, and Dr. Mark's an ER doctor. And, uh, he's been sober, like I said, about, I think about 30 years now. And, and uh, he sees alcoholism all the time, right? I mean, he says he probably sees more alcoholism in the ER than they see on the alcoholic ward, you know? And that's probably true, you know? We alcoholics, we love emergency rooms, don't we? God, I love them. I love I must love them. I always ended up there, you know? I must love them, you know? 
But he'll get guys that will come in, women will come in, you know, gunshot wound, knife wound, you know. He says, I can fix that. You know, fell out of a car. He can fix that, you know, a lot of times. But if somebody comes in and says, listen, do you have a treatment for alcohol? Do you have a cure for alcoholism, right? They don't have a cure for alcoholism today any more than they had in 1939 when they wrote this book, right? We have a treatment today. That's the difference. We have a treatment today that they did not have before Alcoholics Anonymous, okay? All right. Let's flip over to the next page. And here's where they're going to start talking about that one-two punch that I talked about. Step one, the problem. Step two, the solution, right? And they're going to start talking about the symptoms of alcoholism, what alcoholism looks like. It says, we believe, and this is the doctor again, and so suggested a few years ago that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is the manifestation of an allergy. Let's stop right there. Chronic alcoholics, and that's me. See, I'm a chronic <laughs> alcoholic. I'm not an acute alcoholic, right? I mean, I think I'm acute alcoholic, but I'm not an acute alcoholic, right? Right? I'm not a severe alcoholic. I'm not a mild alcoholic. I am a chronic alcoholic. Okay? What does that mean? It means it's never going away, and it's never going to get any better by any treatment that I can impose upon myself. I have it. Whether I'm drunk or sober, I have alcoholism. Okay? And I think there's some confusion about that, right? And our book's going to describe, when we get into the third chapter, some different types of drinkers. And I believe there's more than one type of alcoholic, okay? And I don't try to cause any controversy, but I believe that there's, there's an acute alcoholic. The, the book calls him the hard drinker, right? The book says he may have the habit badly enough to gradually impair him mentally and physically, but if he has a sufficiently strong reason, such as ill health, falling in love, or the warning of a doctor becomes operative, he can stop or moderate. Right. But that's not me. See, I'm a chronic alcoholic. Right. And so I think that that's important as we go through here. The reason I mention that is because when they start talking about the effect of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics, OK, they're talking about the effect of alcohol on guys like me. OK. And that's why the book says again and again and again, when we start getting into the directions for taking the steps, if you're an alcoholic of our type, OK, I don't know if you're an alcoholic of their type, but I know I am. Right. I know I am. It says, the action of alcohol in these chronic, chronic alcoholics is the manifestation of an allergy, that the phenomenon of craving, means it can't be understood, it's a phenomenon, is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. It never occurs. See, I used to think non-alcoholics had great willpower, right? Anybody here ever thought that you look at them, you watch them, and you go... <laughs> My God, you know, they leave a half a glass of wine on the table. I thought, you know, they must be dying to do that, you know. But what I did not realize is because alcohol has a different effect on me. See, they don't have to have willpower. They get all they want every time they drink, right? You see, as Joe and Charlie used to say that, you know, alcoholics, the best way to describe it is that when I have a drink, or two or three drinks, and when the non-alcoholic has two or three drinks, the effect that I get is... Well, let's start with the non-alcoholic, okay? The non-alcoholic gets a slightly tipsy, relaxed, out-of-control feeling, right? And most of the time, they don't like that. And I've talked to non-alcoholics about it. If you've never done that, I suggest you do it. It is fascinating, right? <laughs> Talk to a non-alcoholic. Ask them what happens to them when they have two or three drinks, right? And they'll tell you, we start to feel a little out of control. <laughs> and we don't like that feeling, Rob, Right? Now, that is not the effect I get when I have two or three drinks, right? I get a highly excited, euphoric, in-control feeling, right? You see, they're ready to go to bed, and I'm ready to go to South Beach, right? <laughs> and therein lies the difference, right? You see, for them, alcohol is a depressant. For me, alcohol is a stimulant, okay? And I get a completely different reaction than they get, right? All right. It goes on to say, so that, that top couple sentences there is the first part of step one. I am powerless over alcohol. Why? Because I have a physical allergy. Now they're going to get the second part of step one. Step 1B, one I call it. These allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form, right? Now, for me, in any form includes depressants, 
For me, in any form, it includes other chemicals that affect me from the neck up. That's just me. It says, once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it, once having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon things human, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to solve. My life is now unmanageable. Step 1B. So, as I predicted, they are now going to follow that with my solution. Step 2. For all the emotional appeal seldom suffices. Everybody underline that. Oh, if love could have kept me sober. Boy, I tell you. I had lots of people begging and pleading me. I remember my mother coming and tears rolling down her face, pleading with me to stop drinking, right? And I looked her in the eye and I said, Mom, I'm going to stop for you, right? And I meant it. I meant it, you know? And 24 hours later, I forgot all about it, right? And I was drunk again. It goes on to say the message which can interest and hold these alcoholic people must have depth and weight. It means it's got to make sense. In nearly all cases, their ideals must be grounded in a power greater than themselves if they are to recreate their lives. Right? Step two, a, I, the idea of a power greater than myself restoring me to sanity. Right? Now, we talked about it a little bit last week. There's uh, two of those musts that uh, aren't in our book right there. <clears throat> okay. All right, let's jump down to the, uh, the bottom paragraph on that page. Okay? Here's where we start really getting into the crux of this, and we're going to go through this, and then we'll take a break here. But down at the bottom of this page, Silkworth starts to talk about why we drink. Okay? Why we drink. Why does the alcoholic drink? Right? He's going to outline his, his theory for us. right? And he's going to tell me here what the nature of my problem is, and he's going to tell me what my solution is. I didn't realize this for a long time. Right? He tells me right here what my problem is and what my solution is. He says, men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. Anybody here disagree with that? I didn't think so. All right. <laughs> it says the sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, it is killing me, it is destroying my family and my life, right? They cannot, after a time, differentiate the true from the false. We're coming back to that. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal. And that really is true, isn't it? Right? You know, the, the, the road to hell is not like a straight ski jump like this. It's just this slow progression down and around. And each step of the way, as you pass through those barriers and do those things that you said you'd never do, you make it normal, don't you? Right? That's what I did. Right? I'll never drink in the morning. Okay, well, now I'm drinking in the morning. But I'll never do this. <laughs> and then you do that. And I'll never do that. Right? And you just go on and deeper and deeper into hell. And you make it normal, right? My alcoholic life seems normal to me, right? To everyone else, it looks like complete insanity. But to me, I make it normal, right? It goes on to say, they are restless, irritable, and discontented. And you can add the word shame, fear, guilt, remorse, self-pity, anxiety, resentment, right? And any other adjectives you want, okay? Unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort that comes at once by taking a few drinks, drinks they see others taking with impunity, with, which means without punishment, right? So here I go with my non-alcoholic friend, and I, you know, and, and here's the nature of my problem, and I didn't realize it. Before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I lived my life in a continual state in sobriety, when forced into abstinence, and that was the only time I was sober, when I was forced into abstinence, of restless, irritable, and discontent. Right? That's how I lived. That's how I lived before I started drinking, if I'm honest. Right? I never felt like I was one person. I always felt like I was two halves. Right? And I'll tell you, when I had that first drink at about age 12 or 13 years old, I got a sense of ease and comfort and peace and contentment and belonging that I had never known before. And I had found, I found my medicine, right? But the book says that I am restless, irritable, and discontent when sober, right? You see, so for me, what does that mean? That means my alcoholism starts where my drinking stops. You see, the biggest difference between me and the acute alcoholic is that he puts the plug in the jug and he's fine, right? He's fine. 
He can go on. And we've all known people like that, don't we, right? They have problems with their marriage or their job or whatever. My dad was like that. My dad was what most people call an alcoholic. He had a DUI in 1977. He had a bleeding ulcer as a result of his drinking. He went to the doctor. The doctor, the doctor said, Bob, you've got to stop that or it's going to kill you, right? He put the plug in the jug, never looked back, didn't need no sponsor, didn't need no steps, didn't need no AA, right? He's fine, right? But see, that doesn't work for a guy like me, right? I'm not an acute alcoholic, right? You see, when I'm forced into a state of abstinence, I get restless, irritable, and discontent, and it feels like I'm doing time, right? It feels like I'm doing time, right? It feels like there's this fuse that gets lit, and sometimes it's long, and sometimes it's short, but sooner or later, I'm going to drink. And the surest way that I know that this is a spiritual illness rather than just a physical, only a physical or mental one is this, is that if you're in that state, if you've ever experienced that restlessness, irritability, and discontentedness, that sense that you're just not comfortable in your own skin, sober, if you've ever suffered from alcoholism sober, okay, they can, you can go down to the hospital and they'll put you on an MRI, they'll run every test possible, and they'll tell you there's nothing wrong with you, right? But those of us who have lived through that, we know better, don't we, right? And I'll tell you, there were times when I was forced into a state of absence, and you don't want to be around me when I'm sober, right? You do not want to be around me when I'm forced into a state of abstinence because I get worse, not better, right? And all of a sudden, I get these resentments and these fears and these anxieties, and I don't know why I feel that way. And all of a sudden, I start feeling like I'm either going to kill you or kill me, and I'm not sure which, right? And the only thing that gives me any relief, the book says, is my solution, that sense of ease and comfort that I get from taking a few drinks, right? And I'll tell you, I got that feeling when I was 12 or 13 years old when I had my first drunk, even though I ended up in a blackout and ended up in the hospital with alcohol poisoning, right? And I drank that way progressively for many, many years, right? But the odd thing about alcoholism, the odd thing about alcoholism, you know, normal people would only throw up once, wouldn't they, right? <laughs> only once, right? But not me. See, I don't remember what alcohol does to me. All I remember is that sense of ease and comfort that I get from taking a few drinks, right? And that's what makes me different. And it doesn't make anything different, but for a little while I get a little bit of relief. It makes everything, you know what alcohol does for me really? Is it makes things look better than they really are. It makes me feel better than I really am, right? Because my big fear really is that if you felt the way about me that I felt about me, you really wouldn't like me very much. All right, let's take a five-minute break. My time feeling restless, irritable, and discontent, walking through life feeling like I'm doing time, when I can make it better almost instantly, right? And that's what I did. And that's what I did for a long time, right? And I was one of those alcoholics that I just did not like to be in a state of abstinence. I just, I couldn't, the reason I drink is because I cannot handle life in a state of abstinence. And so I drink, and I drink until I have to get sober. Right? Till I physically cannot stay drunk anymore. Right? And then I stay sober until I have to get drunk. Right? Because I'm restless, irritable, and discontent. And that cycle happened to me over and over and over and over and over again. Right? Until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. All right. So what happens if you take the sense of ease and comfort away from an alcoholic? How are they going to feel? The book says, restless, irritable, and discontent, right? Okay, now that's how I feel. I don't know about you, but that's how I feel, okay? What happens if you take an alcoholic and you take away their sense of ease and comfort and you stick them in an AA meeting? How are they going to feel? Restless, irritable, and discontent, right? And that's how I felt, and I thought I was the odd one, you know? Because all of you seemed happy, right? And I wasn't happy, right? And all of you seemed at peace, and I wasn't very peaceful. I wanted to kill you, you know what I mean? Okay, and I could not understand why. And that's why we talk about that hole in the gut, right? We all, you all heard that, right? I used to say that when I first came in. You come in here, and it's like you've got this big hole in your gut you could drive a Mack truck through, right? And that was really true for me, right? And so if you take away the sense of ease and comfort from an alcoholic, my experience in sponsorship is that you have to replace it with something. You have to replace it with something or they will run to the thing that gives them a temporary sense of ease and comfort, right? 
And Dr. Silkworth is going to begin describing what we replace that sense of ease and comfort that we used to get from alcohol with in the next paragraph. But before he does that, he's going to begin by walking us through what a spree looks like. And he's going to start talking about the second facet of the illness. We already talked about the allergy, which we know is an abnormal reaction to any food, beverage, or substance. Now he's going to begin talking about the obsession of the mind. Top of page, it should be XXIX. That's Roman numeral 29 for those of you who are challenged that way. Top of the page, uh, about three lines down, where it says, after they have succumbed to the desire again. Everybody with me? After they have succumbed to the desire again. Where does the desire come from? Right here, my mind, right? That's where a desire comes from. So the first drink starts where? Right here, right? Right here in my mind. And it says, after I have succumbed to the desire again, and then, as so many do, the phenomenon of craving develops, they pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over and over and over and over and over, right? And that was the truth for me. And every once in a while, I have a mind that tells me it's okay for me to drink. It's what I call the great idea, right? I have a great idea, right? I Last time, it was that vodka that did it to me, you know? I'm just going to have some beer, right? Last time, it was that gin. I can't handle that gin. I get in trouble every time I drink it. So this time, I'll have wine. Right. One time I got this really great idea. I saw in a magazine, I'm flipping through a magazine after a period of abstinence, and I saw this home brew kit. Right. <laughs> and I got a great idea. I said, if I brewed my own beer, maybe I could drink it safely. Right. And on and on. And on. Maybe if I took these pills rather than drinking, maybe that would be OK. Or maybe if I smoked that or shot this or snorted that. Right. Maybe I'd be OK. <laughs> But for a guy like me, to use alcohol in any form always leads me back to the same place. It always leads me back to the same place. And all those alcohol substitutes, all they did was lead me back to drinking, right? If you're a drinker like me, that was always the case for me, right? So I have a mind that occasionally tells me it's okay to drink, right? And then I begin drinking, believing I can do so. And then the phenomenon of craving kicks in. And then I'm not drinking because I want to. I'm drinking because I have to drink, right? And I pass through the well-known stages of a spree, which I did many, many, many times. And usually for me, I would the way that the spree would end is my eyes would open and I would be looking at the roof of the detox, right? And I said the same thing every time. I said, what the hell am I doing here again, right? Again, what am I doing here? Because every time I left detox, I said the same thing. I'm never coming back here again, right? And I meant it every single time, right? And so I was always baffled at how I ended up there again. You know what I mean? And I didn't think I was an alcoholic, but I always seemed to end up where all the alcoholics were. It was a baffling thing. <laughs> so that's step one. We just went over it, okay? Step one. Now they're going to follow that with step Two, the solution. And unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, everybody circle that, there is very little hope of his recovery. So now we're getting a little better. Now we're not hopeless. Now there's very little hope of our recovery. Okay? So we're moving up a little bit. Right? Now, Dr. Silkworth calls it a psychic change. Okay? A change in the psyche or the spirit. A change in the mind. Bill Wilson's going to call it something else. He's going to call it a spiritual experience. They mean exactly the same thing. Just like Bill's going to call it the insanity, and Dr. Silkworth calls it the obsession of the mind. Dr. Silkworth calls it the psychic change. Bill Wilson calls it the spiritual experience. They mean exactly the same thing. Okay. So again, problem in the top of the page, the solution, the idea of a psychic change, a spiritual experience, the idea of a power greater than me, restoring me to sanity, right? It goes on to say, hold on, oh, obsession. Let's talk about obsession for a second. We defined allergy. I wanted to find obsession for you. A thought or idea that overrides all contrary thoughts or ideas. A thought or idea that overrides all contrary thoughts or ideas. What does that mean? It means that I can have every evidence 
that drinking for me is a very bad idea, right? I can know from countless experiences what's going to happen, right? And because I have this obsession, right, every once in a while, my mind is going to convince me that this time it's going to be different, right? That's an obsession, and it will push out all that other stuff that happens, right? Now, I mentioned earlier that I have an, a, another allergy. I have this allergy to pollen, okay? But here's the difference. The difference between my allergy to pollen and my allergy to alcohol is this, that my mind has not told me today or in the recent past, hey, Rob, I got a great idea. You should go roll around in the grass. I think it'll be all right, <laughs> right? You see, I have no obsession when it comes to pollen, okay? But let me tell you something. If pollen had done for me what alcohol did for me, I'd have been snorting that shit, right? Getting as sick as I could get, right? Because that's how I am when it comes to drinking, right? But pollen doesn't do that for me like alcohol does. It doesn't give me that sense of ease and comfort that alcohol gives me, right? All right, now he's going to begin talking about what this solution looks like, right? It says here, men have cried out to me. Oh, wait a minute. Next paragraph up. On the other hand, and strange as this may seem to those who do not understand, once this psychic change has occurred, the very same person who seemed doomed, step one, who had so many problems he despaired of ever solving them, step 1B, suddenly finds himself easily able, everybody circle that word, easily able to control his desire for alcohol, the only effort necessary being that he is required to follow a few simple rules. And what are those rules? The 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, in the 12 Steps and 12 Traditions book, the word rules actually, there's, there's several different uh, definitions of the word rules. One of them is the word principle. A principle and a rule are the same thing, okay? And in the 12 Traditions book, in the beginning, the very forward of the 12, 12 Traditions book, it says that AA's 12 steps are a set of principles spiritual in their nature, which if practiced as a way of life can do two things, can expel the obsession to drink and enable the sufferer to become happily and usefully whole, right? See, one of the things that happens to a guy like me when I work the 12 steps, that's the tradition, when I work the 12 steps is my obsession to drink is removed, right? That's the entire purpose of AA's 12 steps. And the book gives us a great promise here. It says, once this psychic change, spiritual experience in step 12 has occurred, that I am easily able to control my desire for alcohol. And let me tell you something. That has been absolutely true for me. And you're talking to a guy that could not imagine seven days sober. I couldn't imagine five days sober. I couldn't get three or four days sober. I couldn't get three or four days under my belt. But somehow, by some miraculous way, that we, and we, nobody understands exactly why it works, okay, because that's what newcomers say, well, well, why does it work? You know, Well, we don't know why it works. We just know that everybody in this room who's worked this 12 steps has had this spiritual experience and no longer finds it necessary to drink. And I said it last week, and I'm going to say it again for those of you who are new or maybe have been here for a day or two days or eight days, that if you will apply the 12 steps of the program Alcoholics Anonymous, if you will follow every direction in this book, you never have to drink again. Okay. And I'm not just telling you that because it worked for me. I'm telling you that because I, there, you know what? As one of my sponsors used to say, three million sober alcoholics can't be wrong. They can't be wrong. You know? Either I'm wrong or three million sober alcoholics are wrong. Which do you think it is? Right? Okay. So, it's going to tell us when we get to page 85 in our book, this idea of easily being able to, that my problem has been removed. That it doesn't exist for me. That I'm not fighting it. I haven't even sworn off, right? I'm not avoiding temptation, right? That's the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, interestingly enough, the book Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't ever say it. I would challenge anyone to find it for me where it says, okay, stop drinking now. It doesn't say that, does it? You see? It doesn't say That's what they do when you go to a 30-day treatment center. They say, okay, today's your first day of sobriety, and you're going to stop drinking now, right? And don't ever drink again, right? Our book doesn't do that. 
What we do is we apply a spiritual principles to our mental and physical problem. And when we have the spiritual awakening, the desire to drink, the obsession to drink is removed. And that was true for me, and it's been true for many, many, many people that I've sponsored. All right? Now, all right. So this is what we're going to replace this sense of ease and comfort with that we used to get from alcohol. This idea of this spiritual experience, right? This idea of this psychic change is going to replace that sense of ease. I have a sense of ease and comfort today, right? I'm no longer that guy that when I'm forced into a state of abstinence, I'm restless, irritable, and discontent most of the time, okay? Most of the time. Some of the time I am, but most of the time I'm pretty okay, you know? And all I have to do is apply these simple rules, these simple principles, okay? All right. Uh, da, 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 da. All right. Where am I? Oh, yes. Thank you. Men have cried out to me in sincere and despairing appeal. Doctor, I cannot go on like this. I have everything to live for. I must stop, but I cannot. You must help me. Faced with this problem, if a doctor is honest with himself, he must sometimes feel his own inadequacy. Although he often gives all that is in him, is often not enough. Everybody pay attention to this. One feels that something more than human powers need to produce the essential psychic change. Okay? So, if there's something more than human power that's required to produce the psychic change, is my spouse going to keep me sober? How about my sponsor? How about a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous? No. And that was made very clear to me. Okay? By the time I came to Alcoholics Anonymous what, for what I know can be the last time, I'd been to a thousand meetings, okay? I'd been to more meetings, God, you know, your dreary AA proceedings, you know what I mean? And it's just like, you know, it's, I was so bored with Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, you know, and I couldn't figure out because they told me, you know, meeting makers make it, you know, and I wasn't making it, you know. And it had to be explained to me that I'm an alcoholic of their type. I'm a chronic alcoholic. And meetings alone may be enough to keep some people sober, okay? As a matter of fact, when they talk about that acute alcoholic I was mentioning earlier, that hard drinker says that a change of environment may be enough to keep him sober. Maybe coming to meetings for him and not drinking, maybe that works for him. But I can tell you this, it didn't work for me, okay? See, I need the whole deal, right? I need the 12 steps. I need the spiritual experience. Or a guy like me, because I'm of their type, is not going to make it. Right? So if you're sitting here and you've been to a thousand meetings, right? Maybe today will save your life. Okay? If you've been to a thousand meetings and you're not able to stay sober, okay? Maybe it's because you haven't applied the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Maybe you're sitting in the lobby of AA, which is what this is. It's the lobby of AA. But you've never taken the prescription. Right? All right. Let's go over to Bill's story. We're going to hit Bill's story for about 15 or 20 minutes here. All right. You know, I had a hard time relating to Bill Wilson when I first got sober. The language in Bill's story is a little bit archaic. You know, Bill was a, a uh, stock speculator. We call him a stock broker. That's actually being nice to him. Uh, he was a stock speculator from New York. I was from San Francisco. He lived in a different time, in a different era than I lived. The only thing we had in common is we both liked gin, you know. Uh, but uh, but Bill, uh, I think what's important to look at here, the first eight pages of Bill's story, we're going to start, we're going to talk about the problem. And then we're going to segue into what we're going to start talking about next week, which is what did Bill do, what is the action he took to find a solution? And what actions did he take to get sober and to stay sober? And we know that he never drank again, okay? So we're going to start right here. And, you know, I, I always look for where I can relate to Bill Wilson. And like I said, I had a hard time relating to him until I went to a workshop like this and they started kind of dissecting it piece by piece. And I could really see how my experience really mirrored Bill's in a lot of ways. And it says here, War fever ran high in the New England town to which we new young officers from Plattsburgh were assigned. We were flattered when the first citizens took us into their homes, making us feel heroic. Here was love, applause, war, moments sublime with intervals hilarious. I was a part of life that lasted in the midst of the excitement I discovered liquor. I forgot the strong warnings and prejudices of my people concerning drink. In time, we sailed for over there, which is, of course, England. I was very lonely. And again, I turned to alcohol. Gosh, that sure was true for me. You know, alcohol was the best friend I ever had. 
It really is true. Alcohol was always there. Towns, cities and towns came and went. Women came and went. Families came and went. People came and went. Jobs came and went. But alcohol, wherever I was, it always gave me that sense of ease and comfort till the very end. Till the very end, you know. My problem was alcohol, the solution, became alcohol the problem, right? But that was way down the line. And by the time that happened, I still believed it was alcohol the solution, you know. I was still acting as if, see, I lost the ability to tell the truth from the false, right? Page two. I took a night law course and obtained employment as an investor for a surety company. The drive for success was on. I proved to the world I was important. My work took me about Wall Street, and little by little I became interested in the market. Many people lost money, but some became very rich. Why not I? I studied economics and business as well as law. Potential alcoholic that I was, so listen to this, I was... I nearly failed my law course. At one of the finals, I was too drunk to think, all right, I guess that would qualify as a potential alcoholic, right? So by Bill's own admission here, he's a potential alcoholic. Just for a point of reference, Bill's 22 when this takes place, 22. Okay, so for those of you who are a little bit younger, maybe you're in your early 20s and you're in here, you don't have to drink a long time or as long as some people to, uh, to be an alcoholic. Okay, Bill says he's a potential alcoholic at 22. Though my drinking was not yet continuous, it disturbed my wife. We had long talks when I would steal her forebodings by telling her that men of genius conceive their best projects while drunk, that the most majestic constructions of philosophic thought were so derived. You know what we call that? Alcoholic bullshit. That's what we call that. <laughs> yeah. Over on page three. So remember, at the top of page two, he's a potential alcoholic. Second to last paragraph on page three. My drinking assumed more serious proportions, continuing all day and almost every night. This is only four years later. This is 1926. It says, the remonstrances of my friends terminated in a row, which is a fight, and I became a lone wolf. There were many unhappy scenes in our sumptuous apartment. There had been no real infidelity for loyalty to, me, loyalty to my wife, Helped at times by extreme drunkenness, kept me out of those scrapes. Now, that's Bill's side of the story. <laughs> Lois's side of the story, if you read Lois Remembers, is different. That's all I'm going to say about that. All right. Turn over to page five. I know we're going quickly, but I have a lot to cover. Page five. Top of the page, first paragraph. Liquor ceased to be a luxury. It became a necessity. This is 1930. Bill's only been drinking here about eight years, okay? Again, it doesn't have to take a long time to be a a real alcoholic, okay? Now, Bill went through a progression of alcoholism, okay? Some people don't have that type of progression. I did not. I was an alcoholic from the first drink I had, right? I was instantly alcoholic, just like that. I drank alcoholically from the first drink I had till the last drink I had. My first drunk was a blackout. My last drunk was a blackout. And most of the drunks in between were blackouts, too. Okay? That's just how I drank. I did not have this luxury that Bill had of drinking somewhat abusively for a few years and then suddenly losing control. I was out of control from day one. So, just because, so I can't relate to his story that way, but I can relate to when he was lonely, he drank. I can relate to the idea of having marital problems, having financial problems, getting in fights, right? Anybody here ever get in a fight while drunk, right? That you remember? Okay. All right. It says, bathtub gin atop page five, two bottles a day and often three got to be routine. Sometimes a small deal would net a few hundred dollars and I would pay my bills at the bars and delicatessens. You know, if I could ever find a bar that would take credit, man, I'll tell you, I'd be set. It said, this went on endlessly, and I began to waken very early in the morning, shaking violently, onset of delirium tremens, right? And we talk about drug addiction, and and, and I've seen a lot of drug addiction, and how uh, terrible withdrawal from, from drug addiction is. But let me tell you something. Alcohol addiction, you can die in alcohol addiction, you know? And that's why I always encourage people, because back in these days, they'd have to hospitalize these guys in a regular hospital, which oftentimes didn't want them. Today we have the luxury, the luxury, and it is a luxury, to have places to take people who are detoxing from alcohol. And so if there's, there's a choice, I would always 
opt to take somebody unless there's no room for them. I would always opt to take them to a, a, de a medical detox where they can be, can be watched. It says here, uh, a tumbler full of gin followed by a half dozen bottles of beer would be required if I were to eat any breakfast. Now listen to this. Nevertheless, I still thought I could control the situation, right? So what do we call that? Denial, right? Denial. Right. So there were periods of sobriety which renewed my wife's hopes. Gradually things got worse. The house was taken over by the mortgage holder. My mother-in-law died. My wife and father-in-law became ill. Listen to this. He says, then I got a promising business opportunity. Stocks were at a low point of 1932. I had somehow formed a group to buy. I was to share generously in the profits. Then I went on a prodigious bender, and the chance vanished. Bill says, I woke up. This had to be stopped. I saw that I could not take so much as one drink. Everybody underline this next sentence. I was through forever, right? How many people ever said that? I'm through forever. How many people said it more than once? Three times? All right. <laughs> My kind of people, right? It says, before then I had written lots of sweet promises, My wife, but my wife happily observed that this time I meant business, and so I did. So Bill realizes that he can't drink safely, right? He is fully well aware that he cannot drink safely. Let's see what it says in the next paragraph. Shortly afterward, I came home drunk. What happened? Right? What happened? Right? It says, there had been no fight. Where had been my high resolve? I simply didn't know. Right? Uh, it hadn't even come to mind. Someone had pushed a drink my way, and I had taken it. Was I crazy? So Bill's questioning his own sanity here. This is what we call, this is a perfect example of the obsession of the mind isn't it? A perfect example of the obsession that his mind told him that he could drink, even though he knew. He knew that he couldn't. He promised his wife, right? And I'm sure he planned that it was going to be different this time, right? I'm sure he planned how he was going to do different than he had done the last time. But Bill doesn't understand the nature of his illness, does he, right? He doesn't understand his allergy and the obsession of the mind, right? By the way, at this time, if you read Lois Remember, she says that for five years, by this time in 1932, they've been trying daily for five years to help Bill stop drinking and had been unsuccessful. Okay? It goes on to say, I began to wonder for such an appalling lack of perspective seemed near being just that. Renewing my resolve, I tried again. Some time passed, and confidence began to be replaced by cocksuredness. I could laugh at the gin mills. Now I had what it takes. One day I walked into a cafe to telephone. In no time I was beating on the bar asking myself how it happened, right? He walked into the bar with no intention of drinking, right? A little bit later on in the book in chapter 3, we're going to get the example of a guy named Jim, right? And Jim's the traveling salesman who stopped at a roadside place to get a bite to eat, right? And he had a great idea, which I'm not going to talk about today, right? It says, as the whiskey rose to my head, I told myself I would manage better next time. Uh, but I might as well get good and drunk then, and I did, right? So then the allergy kicks in, and away he goes, right? He goes on to say, the remorse, horror, and hopelessness of the next morning are unforgettable. The courage to do battle was not there. My brain raced uncontrollably, and there was a terrible sense of impending calamity. And if anybody here has ever come out, and I know some of you have, come out of a drunk when you knew you blew it again, right? And you knew you let down your family and your friends, and you knew you were going back to jail, and you knew you were not going to be able to pass your urine test, and you knew your kids were going to look at you the minute you walked out of that bedroom with that same disgusted look on their face, right? You understand what he's talking about here, don't you? Right? And here's the worst part. He says, my brain raced uncontrollably. You know what the worst part of all that is? That as all that's going on, all I can think about was where I'm going to, who I'm going to con, where am I going to steal $5 to get a bottle of Gilby's gin? Right? That's the worst part. Right? It goes on to say, I hardly dared cross the street lest I collapse and be run down by an early morning truck. It was scarcely daylight. An all-night place supplied me with a dozen glasses of ale. My writhing nerves were still at last. 
The morning paper told me the market had gone to hell again. Well, so would I. The market would recover, but I wouldn't. That was a hard thought. Should I kill myself? No, not that. Not, no, not now. Then a mental fog settled down. That's depression. A mental fog settled down. Gin would fix that. That's my kind of guy right there. Boy, I can relate to that. So two bottles and oblivion, right? Now listen to this. You know, people say we're weak-willed people. Anybody ever heard that? Alcoholics are weak-willed people, right? You know, I tell you, I've sponsored a lot of people, alcoholics, but I've sponsored some drug addicts too. And I've always said, you know, you try to keep up a $500 a day habit without a job. It takes incredible willpower to do that, you know? But listen to this. He says, listen to the willpower of Bill Wilson here. It says, the mind and the body are marvelous mechanisms for mind endured this agony two more years. Two years of every day waking before dawn, right? Every day thinking about killing himself, right? Sometimes I stole from the, my wife's slender purse when the morning terror and madness were on me. Now he's calling the obsession the terror and the madness. Again, I swayed dizzily before an open window or the medicine cabinet where there was poison Cursing myself for a weakling. There were flights from city to country and back as my wife and I sought escape. What do we call that? Geographic. That's right. Then came the night where the physical, that's the craving, and the mental, that's the obsession, torture, was so hellish, I feared I would burst through my window, sash it on. I could really relate to Bill here because in 1986, I almost jumped out a second story window because I couldn't take it anymore. Any window jumpers here, by the way? Man, I am different. All right. <clears throat> Somehow I managed to drag the mattress to a lower floor lest I suddenly leap. Now listen to this. A doctor came with a heavy sedative. Next day found me drinking both gin and sedative. This combination soon landed me on the rocks. Everybody underline that. You know what we call that? Dual addiction. That's what we call that. Now we have singleness of purpose in Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay? And we're here to treat alcoholism and thank God we are. Okay? But don't ever let anybody tell you that if you have a drug problem, okay, in conjunction with alcoholism, that you are not welcome in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because if that was the case, let me tell you something. Neither one of our co-founders could have attended, okay, because they were both duly addicted, okay? And anyone that tells you anything other than that has not studied the history. All right. It goes on to say, people feared for my sanity and so did I. I could eat little or nothing. And I was 40 under pounds, 40 pounds underweight. And I wrote right here in my book, Dying, right? Bill's dying. You get an alcoholic who's 40 pounds underweight, they are dying, okay? And oftentimes it's because, a little uh, medical knowledge here, because the body from drinking so much, even though you may be eating food, the body, alcohol is a simple sugar, will actually reject the food in favor of breaking down the alcohol, which is more easy for the body to break down, okay? So even though you may try to eat, you will still come in malnourished. And a lot of times we see that, right? Uh, let's jump over to page 8. Actually, I take that back. Back to 7, sorry. I at least do that once in session, too. Okay, first paragraph. My brother-in-law is a physician, and through his kindness and that of my mother, I was placed in a nationally known hospital under the... Uh, for the mental and physical rehabilitation of alcoholics under the so-called belladonna treatment, my brain cleared. Belladonna was a drug back in the 30s that they used to give alcoholics. It was made from angel trumpet blossoms. It's actually the drug atrophine, and uh, they would make tea out of it. And it's kind of the same concept of, uh, uh, what do they give heroin addicts? Uh, uh, method, methadone. Same kind of concept that if you could recreate the same effect, you could wean them off the alcohol. So this is what they're trying with Bill here in the 30s. Hydrotherapy and mild exercise help much. Best of all, I met a kind doctor, that's Silkworth, who explained that though certainly selfish and foolish, I had been seriously ill bodily, that's the allergy, and mentally the obsession. So Silkworth tells Bill about the, the nature of his illness. He tells him about the allergy and the obsession. He goes on to say, It relieved me somewhat to learn that in alcoholics the will is amazingly weakened when it comes to combating liquor though it often remains strong in other respects. He says, My incredible behavior in the face of a desperate desire to stop was explained. Right? He says, Understanding myself now, I fared forth in high hope. For three or four months, the goose hung high. I went to town regularly, even made a little money. Surely this was the answer 
self-knowledge. We're going to find out next week that self-knowledge alone is not enough, right? It says, but it was not. The frightful day came when I drank once more. The curve of my declining moral and bodily health fell off like a ski jump. After a time, I returned to the hospital. This was the finish. The curtain, it seemed. My weary and despairing wife was informed it would all end in heart failure during delirium tremens or that I would develop a wet brain perhaps within a year. She would soon have to give me over to the undertaker or the asylum. Listen to what Bill says here. He says, I, they didn't need to tell me. I knew. I knew. And almost welcomed the idea. It was a devastating blow to my pride. I, who had thought so well of myself and of my abilities, my capacity to surmount obstacles, was cornered at last. Let's jump down to the next paragraph. And this is where Bill really hits his bottom. And I'll tell you what. This was, this was the, probably the one paragraph in the book that grabbed me the first time I read it, you know. Because, boy, when I, that last time I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, this is where I was right here. It says, No words can tell of the loneliness and despair I found in that bitter morass of self-pity. Quicksand stretched about me in all directions. I had met my match. I had been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. Right? And I'll tell you, I will never forget that feeling. Right? I will never forget, and I hope I never forget that feeling, right? Now, what did Bill just do, whether he knew it or not? He just took step one, didn't he? Right? Now, there's a reason I point that out, because let's look at the next paragraph. It says, trembling, I stepped from the hospital a broken man. Now, remember, he knows his problem, and he's just taken step one, hasn't he? Right? Fear sobered me for a bit. And then came the insidious insanity of the first drink, the obsession. And on Armistice Day 1934, I was off again. Let's stop right there. Okay? So what does that tell me? It tells me there is not enough power in step one to keep me sober. Right? Here's Bill. He's accepted the idea of step one. Right? He knows alcohol is his master. He knows he's defeated. He knows he's hopeless. He steps from the hospital a broken man. And it says fear sobered him for a little while. Okay? But fear's not enough to keep us sober, is it? Right? Fear's not enough to keep me permanently sober. It can keep me sober for a while, right? But sooner or later, that fear diminishes, right? And all of a sudden, I get a great idea, right? I know what's going to make me feel better, right? All right. Uh, we're going to, I think, stop right there. Uh, the one thing I wanted to talk about is he talks about the insanity of the first drink. And if you look up the words insanity, I think one of the best definitions I've heard is is less than sane or less than whole, right? And I've sat in meetings and heard people, they point up to the second step and they say, well, step two says I'm crazy, right? Anybody ever heard that, right? Step two does not say I'm crazy, okay? If you look through the book, as a matter of fact, for those of you who still have your books out, let's cross-reference this for a second here. Keep your finger right there and turn to page 38, And we'll end, I promise. Second paragraph down says, You may think our illustration too ridiculous, but is it? We have been through the ringer, have to admit, if we substituted alcoholism for jaywalking, the illustration would fit us exactly. However intelligent we may have been in other respects where alcohol has been involved, we have been strangely insane. Everybody see that? All right, turn to page 40. Second paragraph down. Let him tell you about it. I was much impressed with you fellows and what you said about alcoholism, and I frankly did not believe it would be possible for me to drink again. I rather appreciated your ideas about the subtle insanity which precedes the first drink. Turn to page 92. First paragraph. If you are satisfied that he is a real alcoholic, begin to dwell on the hopeless feature of the malady. Shown from your own experience, the queer mental condition surrounding that first drink prevents the normal functioning of the will. Last one, page 154. Second to last paragraph on the page. Of course he couldn't drink, but why not sit hopefully at a table, a bottle of ginger ale before him? After all, had he not been sober six months now, perhaps he could handle, say, three drinks, no more. Fear gripped him. He was on thin ice. Again, it was that old insidious insanity, that first drink, right? All right, back on page 8. The insanity that we're talking about in step 2 is very simple. It's the insanity that comes right before I take the first drink, right? They're not talking about clinical insanity here, okay? 
If you're clinically insane, they mark your chart clinically insane, and you never get well from clinical insanity. If that's what they were talking about, then it wouldn't say on page 84, for by this time, sanity will have returned, right? We're going to end on that note. All I want to say in closing here is that if you're new, we have a way that will do for you slowly what alcohol did for you quickly. That really what the 12 steps do for a guy like me is they give me that psychic change so that I no longer find it necessary to temporarily find one through drinking. And that's it for today. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.